So welcome everybody. You're our first group. I just want to introduce Tom and Ethan to you. I will give you guys going. I'll start calling you in order so everyone else can uh, turn your cameras off, please. I'm going to start with Tessa. She'll ask a question and then I'll go in order as your um, confirmation letter outlined. Okay, so I think we're about ready. So I'm going to go dark. Tessa, welcome. Hi. Meet Hi, Tessa. Hi, Hi Tessa. guys. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, da Daddy's geeky too. Yes. <laughs> Uh, my question, my first question for both of you, I want to know what attracted you guys to the role of SpongeBob. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'll go first just in chronological order, but uh, uh, for me, it was just uh, Steve Hillenberg showed me the pitch for the show, and I, I knew him from a previous cartoon that we had both been employed on, and then he, now he was pitching his own show, stepping out, you know, for SpongeBob, his first, kind of his first show idea, you know? And uh, and it just it just knocked me out immediately. Like I just, I just fell in love with it. And and you know I always say, you know when you're an actor like me and Ethan, you're you're just always auditioning for stuff that you're hoping you'll get, and then some of it you get, and a lot of it you don't. It's just how how the business goes, you know. And you build up this rhino skin for the stuff you didn't you didn't get, you know. But but SpongeBob was one of the few times where I looked at something and I just knew that if I didn't if I didn't play this guy portray this character i it would be tragic for me personally like i like i i would never i really wanted to play him and i'm like i understand him i, I gotta be him you know and, and usually you gotta be a little more business like it's like being a cop or something you know you can't get totally involved in all the cases you know what i mean or you'll lose your mind so so that was what attracted me was really just the characters the stories uh the look of it just just steve's steve's vision uh in a in to, to put it short you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess the answer for me is um, a little bit the same, but only because it was true for Tom, which is like, I watched the show and I fell in love with the humor. And actually, I mean, more than that, it was sort of definitive for me and my friends. Like, it became the sense of humor that connected us all together and that we grew up with. So the fact that Tom was so inspired by, um, by Steven Hillenberg's work, like, at the get-go seeped through for for all of the years of making it until I got to sort of do my own interpretation um and that was like that was really exciting for me and also speaking of the rhino thick skin I never thought in a million years I was going to get it off of this audition you know it was like one of my it was my first professional audition I was a college student and um they only like they had seen me audition for like a summer program and they were like <laughs> you actually like, you might have the right shape. So like, would you want to come in? <laughs> Which is um, but a blessing and also just so hurtful. <laughs> you might have the right shape. That, that's like when they tell me I have a face made for voiceover. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, for someone who's square with, uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I just sort of fell in love with the, with the physical comedy of it all. And there's this like really fun, um, sort of chicken or the egg thing happening, which is that I think the comedy in the show is so like rooted in this silent film sort of slapstick. Mm. And um, you love that stuff. I, and I, I, I'm obsessed with it. Um, and so to be able to like look at the cartoon and see how was it inspired by silent film and how can I sort of take that and sort of like reverse engineer it or something um, was incredibly fun. And so um, you know, let's let's say that I had the choice to pick playing the role. That would be why I picked it. But really, I'm just really grateful it picked me. But it's interesting you mentioned that, Ethan. Like, I, I know about your love for, like, silent comedy and old old film comedy and stuff. Like, the, you know, just like the bedrock of everything, you know, which a lot of people, even even my age, don't know about, let alone your age, you know. And and I think, um, you know, knowing Steve like I did and, and his guys like I do, that was a big part of them too. So uh, I'm, you know, now I'm seeing that 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 love of that stuff is kind of like the through line through through Steve getting this idea and drawing it in a notebook and to to the pitch to the series to the mm. to the Broadway show to, to Ethan, you know. And it's a uh, that that's kind of amazing, you know. It's 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 really all about those roots, you know. It's like it's like comedy blues, you know. Totally. And it's well, one of the things that he, when he came to like our rehearsals and things early on, he was, um, he sort of pointed out, which was super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. He was very articulate, like very, very uh, soft spoken, very soft spoken, but very definitive and, uh, and, and uh, about 
about what he saw and what he wanted things to be, you know? So, so uh, yeah, very helpful guy and, and personality type in that he lets the art, he let the artist, lets the artists do what they, uh, you know, he picks you cause he likes what you're doing and then he kind of lets you do that. And, but he also offers, offers very helpful uh, parameters, you know, that, but not too many of them where it would box you in. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> you are the right shape, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Tessa. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. She'll be back. Next we have I'll be a back. <laughs> She'll be back. Amanda Taylor, she's from uh, uh, Geeky Geekly Amanda. <laughs> Hi, Geekly Amanda. <laughs> Lots of geeks here today. <laughs> hey, you can look, look, look what's behind me. Uh, I you're see. Pre you're, preach you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> look. Are we running? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, my question is, um, what were the, like, the most challenging parts of bringing uh, animated characters to like this, the stage? Yeah. Well, I would say that, you know, our worry, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, not really our worry because you know the cast worry really but but i know steve and some of the creatives were you know the conversations i was hearing as this was just being pitched in the planning stages were does this really need to exist you know what i mean will this you know steve was very thought steve thought very uh he didn't think like a business guy he wasn't a profit mm -hmm. guy like oh this will be an ancillary income you know like he wasn't that kind of person so uh, you know, corporations think like that, but Steve wasn't a corporation. So, so he was like, does this really need to exist? Why are they going to, you know, what if it's really bad and it's actually damaging to the, to this thing that I built so carefully. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, and I think once he met with Tina Landau and, and, you know, the, the people that were making the show and, you know, all along the line, you know, does, you know, the visually and, and musically and cast wise, uh, you know, Ethan and his, cohorts who are all fantastic I, I i saw the worry be replaced by intense and en like enthusiasm by steve and his and his the guys that he works the closest mm -hmm. with uh, mark ceccarelli and vince waller and i once they stopped worrying i stopped worrying i'm like if steve's not worried this is gonna be if, if steve thinks this might be pretty good it's gonna be awesome <laughs> so he, <laughs> sorry to talk so long <laughs> no, that's that's such a, that's so good. Um, I think that skepticism was like the the thing that was the hardest about it, and it was also mm -hmm. the thing that made it good. Was um, I know I fully embrace and understand skepticism around taking a cartoon <laughs> and putting it on stage. Like I felt it too, um, but so did Tina, who uh, yeah, so did the stage show. And I, I'm not gonna tell her own stories for her, but um, she does tell <laughs> some great stories about like the first time that she heard about it and how reticent she was to pitch the show until she had an epiphany, which was like, oh, we could do this really cool. <laughs> you know, like, we, we could um, make sure to keep the, the, the spirit of SpongeBob and not do an arena show, not do foam costumes, but try to like figure out how to humanize these characters um, in, in, in terms of like the physicality. Uh, and so the first workshop that we did in development was just two weeks, there was no script, there was no music. It was just, let's show up and take gags from the show and see how we could do them with our bodies. Um, or cool. Take, yeah, it was amazing. It was awesome. I, never, I never heard that. Oh my, oh, it was so cool. Tommy would have loved it. It was oh, like- I, I, I hope somebody was filming. I'm sure, I'm sure Tina was, but she won't let anyone see it. Um, no, that, so much for the DVD extra. I, know, I, know. I was going to say bonus material. <laughs> I, wish. I mean, it was really amazing things. She would just be like, all right, you guys, groups of three, you have 15 minutes to show what it looks like if gravity stops working. Um, and wow, then we it's like boot camp. Off. It was so, it was like boot camp. No, exactly. And like, we were getting these skills together that we could just like weave together. Um, so that skepticism that was like at the core of it was like, how do we make this like right um, was the challenge, but also the opportunity of it. And it became uh, so fun to just mess around. Yeah. Once they came back and, 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 you know, they started to get, you know, it was like in stages where, where, where Steven, Steven, his top guys were, were like skeptical, like you said, Ethan, and then like kind of curious and then kind of like, kind of their confidence i saw their confidence level rising and then like i said then it 
once, once it turned into full blown, this is really cool. This is going to be great. I love this enthusiasm. It was so such a relief for me, you know, not that I have any say in it at all, but, 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 you know, just as being a part of the, of the whole, uh, uh, you know, SpongeBob world construct, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it was really cool. And I think, I guess privately my thoughts at the time were, cause I, you know, I ne- like SpongeBob, I, ne- I, I always want to be positive and not be a Debbie Downer, you know? So, so I was always like, just mathematically speaking to myself, the, there's a lot more ways for this to go wrong than to go right. You know what I mean? Like just, just, you know what I mean? Like the number of ways it could be like some heaven's gate debacle or our, our, our legion. And, the, but, but you, you know, it's almost like getting it right is almost like a, like a sharp shooter. Like, you know, it's, it's almost like shooting an arrow off of somebody's, you know, an apple off of somebody's yeah. head with an arrow or something. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like the, the star Wars, uh, 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 you know, uh, shaft, you know, air shaft. So, and, and Tina and, and these guys, uh, totally totally did that you know against the odds you know they 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 blew up the death star of a uh, potential failure and embarrassment <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> thank you thanks guys <laughs> you bet. My, my my pleasure amanda next we have linda lee she's one of our junior reporters hi linda hi. lee hi hi nice to meet you great nice to see to you um, I love so, all your stuff behind you. Oh, thank you. It's my dad's room. <laughs> oh, nerd. <laughs> um, Tell your dad he's so, a nerd. Okay, you're a nerd. What? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, in each of your SpongeBob voices, can you tell us or sing us why people are going to love SpongeBob the Musical on DVD? Oh my gosh, singing! I better leave that to Ethan. <laughs> oh no. But, <laughs> um. How am I going to sing this? Well, I think that everyone is going to love the SpongeBob musical on DVD because it's the best day ever and you can watch it over and over and over. <laughs> just in case you didn't get a chance to see it on Broadway. Just in case the touring company was canceled by pandemic before it came to your town. This is a way to watch SpongeBob. Broadway musical over and over and over and over and over and over and over in the privacy of your take it, Gary. Meow. Right home. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> too soon? Too much? No. Never. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I believe that was great. I like that E.T. wore his top hat for, for the interview today. <laughs> This is uh, Mandy Cooper. He's all dressed up. Out of Georgia. Yes, that was fantastic. That just made my day. That little mini performance right there. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> so going right into that, aside from an amazing musical like SpongeBob, what are some other great ways to get kids excited about theater and the arts like this? Oh, you know, I, th- I think um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think for from my point of view, the best way to get kids excited about theater and the arts is a combination of accessibility to see it. Um, You know, it's not easy to fly from anywhere in the world to New York, especially nowadays when theater is harder and harder to um, make live. So accessibility in in terms of access on TV and streamers and all of that. Um, But then also arts education in schools. For me, getting to be in a theater class or getting having theater be part of my curriculum in elementary school um, is what started the line of really loving it and being passionate about it and using it as a way to explore not just my love of performing, but my love of writing and reading and applying math and set building as, I, as the arts education in high school grew. So I think that, um, yeah, in short, it's the combination of accessibility and arts funding. Yeah, great, great point, Ethan. And and you're right. Like, uh, you know, it has to be there for kids to find. And then, and then, you know, I, I love what you said about how, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. It's not, you know, it sounds like w- whatever draws somebody into something initially, uh, it's not, you know, for you, it went way beyond look at me, look at me where you said it was, you know, where, where it was like writing and which you do and, and, and math and set building. And like, there's so many uh, ways uh, uh, 
for, for to be involved in that world, even if you're not an out front kind of person, you know, like, mm -hmm. like being a voiceover person is kind of like, for me, the perfect combination of, of being out there, but not out there, you know, like I call it the shy show off, you know, mm -hmm. like if I had a personality, it would be, it would be the guy who wants to show off, but he's like a little uh, uh, cowardly about it. So, so it's, uh, you know, it has to, it has to be there. And of course, with what's going on now and, and zoom and everything, uh, it probably, it's probably a little harder to do, but also takes on even greater importance. I know I have a 17 year old daughter that's doing zoom high school in the room right next door to me right now. And her play pro class drama class is the bright spot in her day. Like those kids and that tribe that she found in that world, which, you know, we did too, is it, it really is life changing. I mean, it, it kind of changes your whole life, no matter what you go on to do, even if you don't go on to do anything uh, in show business or whatever, but uh, you know, it's, it's just really useful no matter what you wind up doing. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up, we've got Ashley. She's with Ashley and Company. Hey, Ashley. Hey guys. How's it going? Nice background. Yeah. Thanks. It's better than my bedroom because, like you said, <laughs> my kids are on Zoom. So, like, I have to find a corner that's free in my house. Yeah, this, <laughs> so. this is a virtual background of a boring middle-aged guy's <laughs> office. It's not in my real office. No, so, that's okay. fine. You should see all my geeky stuff, yeah. but my husband's in my office. So anyways. <laughs> well, I, I preach it. Yeah, I know. I know. It's You're describing my life. You're describing my life. So yeah. So it's so exciting to talk to you both. Um, Tom, you like literally have voiced my childhood. I'm sure as, as a lot of people that are on this call right now. Um, <laughs> What is it like, you know, you made so many memories for me, like my sister and now my oh, kids, cool. like, what is it like, you know, you're still doing this character and you're still making, you're making memories now for a whole new generation. Yeah. And then Ethan, you're stepping into this role and also making memories for kids in a whole different way for SpongeBob. So what is that like for you guys? Well, I got to say, you know, yeah, look, we're still making episodes. Like I'm, I'm on zoom doing spongebob recording or directing the other actors either or three three days a week you know you during even during pandemic so so spongebob is still a huge part of my life and it's been 20 some odd years like that and really uh you ask what it's like i mean i, I just look at it as this fantastic gift that it's not even like an opportunity uh, like it's more like a gift you know it's it's just a you know, to, to play a character that's so fun and that, uh, you know, that I have so much respect for the creator of and, and the, the co-workers that I work with on it and that, that it struck a chord multi, as it turns out, multi-generationally, uh, you know, it's just, wow, I, I, I'm in a really rarefied uh, 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 demographic, you know, like how many actors get to get to play a character for that long and still love it. Like where it's not, it's not a burden. It's like, Oh, I can't wait to not be playing this guy anymore. It's, I, you know, I love SpongeBob, you know, and it's it, the, the length of time it's gone on feels like uh, bonus rounds on a game show. You know, like I, I, I feel like I keep uh, uh, winning more uh, washing machines, you know, it's great. So, uh, so yeah, so, so that's, that's how it feels to me. And then one thing, if I, before, before Ethan uh, comes in, it, it, it's one thing we always try to remember while we're making the shows is that the episode we're making right now after 20 years might might very well be somebody's first exposure to SpongeBob. Like it might be the first episode mm -hmm. some kid watches or somebody goes, you know, I never watched the show, but I tuned us in and it was pretty fun. And then I went back and watched all of them. And the Broadway show and Ethan's performance as SpongeBob is the first exposure to SpongeBob, like, like exposure for a lot of kid, uh, people that parents and kids alike that didn't see the cartoon before they saw the Broadway show. Uh, you know, the, I have talked to a lot of those people. So, you know, e Ethan's the, the on-ramp to SpongeBob for a, a lot of people as well. Yeah, it definitely feels like a slightly different scale, but um, the, you know, like, I think that, I mean, you know, he's sitting right here, so it's a little hard to talk about him as though he's not, but Tom's influence is just like, so, oh yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> um, his influence is just like so huge and, and amazing um, as SpongeBob, but just like as a voice of comedy. Um, I, and I think that that is like a really special thing to be in the orbit of, you know, and to be in his orbit. And so um, I feel really lucky to 
just be this close. You know, that's it's a really, really amazing thing. And then I, I do think that there's there's an element of being the on-ramp for SpongeBob for some people, but I think more so while we were running and now that we're, uh, you know, you can get the show on DVD and like that is an on-ramp for people to Broadway. Um, and I think that that's a really exciting thing that feels like, in some ways it feels like a big responsibility, but I also feel really proud of the work that we've done. So I feel really confident in it, you know, like it's a really Absolutely. cool way to, to bring people from the SpongeBob world into the Broadway world, which is a community that I think is really beautiful and thriving. Um, and so like to be a part of that crossover feels particularly special. Yeah, ag agreed on all points, Ethan, man. It's it's multiple on-ramps, you're right. I mean, I mean, you know, this, like you said, on-ramp to Broadway, That there's that aspect uh, aspect as well. Yeah. That's huge. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Next, we've got Amy. She's from As the Bunny Hops out of North Carolina. Hi, guys. Hi, Amy. Um, so I... Like I have to talk about the music. The music in the show is amazing. And what blows my mind are all of the huge big name artists who contributed music to the show. I mean, David Bowie, Cindy Lauper, John Legend, Tom Kenny. And <laughs> I just want to know how involved some of the artists were in the production. Wow. Well, uh, Ethan could probably uh, answer that uh, better than me because it's part of the Broadway uh, uh construct you know I, I know i know that with best day ever that was just a song that that my songwriting partner and i andy paley wrote really f not just for ourselves uh, uh you know way back in the 2000s uh early 2000s uh because we, we 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 wanted to write a song that was sort of like encapsulated spongebob's philosophy and way of of looking at the world kind of like you know uh, like a loving spoonful do you believe in magic you know kind of like that you know like we were like that's what it should be so and then that song kind of kept winding up in different places it wound up in an episode of the show it wound up over the closing credits of the first spongebob movie it wound up uh you know in in theme park shows and commercials and and then and then it wound up uh, getting used in the broadway show so so that was that was how that song wound up in there but ethan you probably have more insight into uh the 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 the, the musical uh cherry picking of, of Tina and everybody. You know, I have a little bit more insight, maybe, just because um, <laughs> I remember the songs as they rolled in. You know, oh. I started working on it before there was any music. And then, uh, although I will say that in the first workshop that we did, we learned Best Day Ever. I played it on ukulele and guitar. And, nice. you know, um, Danny was playing trombone and, you know, everyone was just like, <laughs> we didn't have, a, you know, it was just this great sort of weird band and all of the music was, all the drums were done by Foley. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, the, I think what was really cool about it was I remember talking about the music before any of the artists gave songs and, and Tina Landau, who directed the show and conceived of the stage production, um, was saying, you know, like, SpongeBob has the best, like, uh, scores like there's there's always these amazing songs curated for the spongebob movies and for you know all of these things um she's like you know wilco weezer ween um anything else with a w that you can name you know th those are the <laughs> ones so sh she was like intent on finding cool artists who also were right for the moment um and they were really specifically picked for those moments like it was you know we knew that there was going to be um, a really beautiful, soulful sort of love, uh, platonic love ballad between uh, SpongeBob and Patrick at I Guess I Miss You. Um, we knew that there was going to be, you know, the B BFF was going to be called BFF. You know, all these things were sort right. of known. And father-daughter song between Mr. Krabs and Pearl, right? Like like you guys knew where those those pins were stuck in the, the musical uh, bulletin board. Exactly. Wow. And, and well, they, I will say Steve was a big music guy too, Steve Hillenberg was yeah. a big music guy and, and, and like listened to a lot of music, had really good taste in music or, or maybe the same bad taste that I do. I don't know. Uh, whenever somebody has the same taste you do, you think you go, they have good taste, but maybe we just both had crappy taste. I don't think so. But, but, but he, uh, you know, him and I would go to see music shows a lot, you know, uh, uh, especially in the early days of SpongeBob before it got so crazy for him, uh, uh, including Bowie, like, like early, early on, like, like, you know, 2000, you know, him and I go to see Bowie, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, so I think that was really important to him as well. And I think the music chosen for the, the, the show and, and the, 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 the various styles and stuff kind of does 
uh, reflect that panoply, that cornucopia of of, uh, of of styles. You know, Steve Steve was very uh, uh, Catholic, small C uh, small C Catholic in his uh, taste in in music. Hmm. You know, I, and I think he, that he sort of, a lot of different stuff. To, to speak again to like Steve's influence on it when um, when all of these artists were like first choice artists they reached out to them thinking like ah you know they're not going to be available like john legend's not going to be able to do this and everyone said yes because they love spongebob and they love the ethos of spongebob and they wanted to be a part of it and so everyone wrote original songs you know it was like this really amazing um like show of love for the show and it, it i think it really shines through i think every song is pretty Great. Yeah, it's and, and that that's a powerful, uh, 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 you know, very useful, I should say, uh, aspect of SpongeBob is that it is something that people kind of want to work on and be uh, adjacent to, you know. So so it's never really you never really have to like twist anybody's arm super hard to do something on on SpongeBob. They you know they like Sp SpongeBob SpongeBob as a, as a property or whatever just enjoys really uh goodwill a lot of goodwill out there in the world so 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 that's very that's very helpful thank you so Elaboration much Collaboration wise mm -hmm. thanks so much amy thank you amy so tom and ethan worried about time we're running a little bit late i'd love for that's um me. to get one more question in but i don't think that's going to happen so at least i can start off with getting tessa one in and then if that's okay um yeah I, what do you got what do you got to do should we just get them all? I mean, well, I mean, I'm cool to do whatever. Okay. Well, if we can, if we, if we can definitely maybe speed the questions up a little bit, we'll try to blow through these last ones as fast as we can. All right. Cool. Sounds good. Lightning round. <laughs> right. Well, I'm Definitely. back. Hi, guys. Okay, I'll be quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to know, Ethan, were you intimidated at all to like take on the role of SpongeBob? He's so iconic and amazing. Thanks to Tom. Oh my God, dreadfully so. Yeah, it was so intimidating, but it was also, um, I think it was the, the thing that was really liberating pretty quickly was that uh, Tina was was um, quick to say, like, it's got to be Ethan's version of SpongeBob. Don't do an impression of Tom um, because you're never going to be Tom SpongeBob. You're never going to be the cartoon SpongeBob. What you want to do is like make it part of you and like just when you talk you're talking and it's you um and so putting my own interpretation on it was like really freeing and also i think made it feel more truthful and honest and real yes i also <laughs> ethan i think maybe your background as an athlete might have something to do with that too like like you know what i mean like just getting in and doing it you know what i mean like like just getting in there and get get, get there in the ring and do your best you know yeah, get it in your body and the rest will follow, sort of. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, hey. Tessa. Amanda, you're up next. Hey, again. Hi. Hi right, I'll be quick, too. So I, I want to know, it. you're bringing this to the, you know, a DVD out next month the, the on stage. Did you have to do any special, you know, taping or voiceovers or anything for the DVD? Well, I mean, when we were filming it, uh, when we were filming the the production, uh, Tom and I did a bunch of stuff. A bunch of other cast members did like the, I don't know what's going to be on it, to be honest. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't not. either. Maybe not. I haven't but we got my but, copy yet. Yeah, me neither. Uh, so I probably shouldn't answer this, but we did do some fun other stuff like around the theater um, with. Uh, uh patchy and and the cast and so that was pretty great yeah because it was it was aired as a special on on um nickelodeon first so 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 there were like some framing devices and kind of leading up to the broadcast kind of stuff between patchy the pirate the world's biggest spongebob fan and the cast of the broadway show so i and i don't know if any of that made it onto the dvd but i i will say you know i think i can say this is that the broadway show was never filmed when it was happening so it had to be remounted and filmed for this special slash DVD. So, uh, so, so, so that was definitely some special stuff that had to be done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now I'm going to be looking out for your little stuff on <laughs> maybe a yeah, bonus. Yeah, I hope. Thank I'm you. Sure it's on YouTube if it's not <laughs> yeah. on the DVD. <laughs> That's true. Hey, Linda Lee, you're up next. Hi, Linda Lee. Hi. Um. So, Tom, for this special recorded version of the musical, you got to play Patchy the Pirate on stage. So what was that experience like to go from behind the microphone voicing the character to being the character for this production? 
Well, it was fun. I'm usually patchy on the show, but usually patchy hosts like holiday specials and stuff. So it's usually just patchy talking directly to the camera. You know, he doesn't really interact with SpongeBob, uh, you know, the cartoon character much. They're in two separate worlds. Yeah. That, that was a Steve Hillenberg rule. But, but, um, you know, for me, like I'm not a stage actor. I never was. So, and having seen the show on Broadway uh, a couple of times, I, I, uh, you know, it was really intimidating to go, you know, these guys are like the pro of the pros and, and going and, and, you know, basically I felt like I was stepping into something that I didn't really totally know how to yeah. do, but I guess like Ethan was talking about uh, with the last questioner, when he, when he got the part, you know, uh, when you're in an unfamiliar situation, you just, and you just want to make it yours and do the best that uh, best that you can do. Cause there was Apache in the, in the Broadway show originally that, Mm -hmm. uh, played by somebody who wasn't me who did a great job so so yeah you just get in there and try your best and and hope it's hope it goes okay that's kind of my whole approach to life thank you have a nice Thanks, day Linda Lee. ashley you're up next hey hey ashley i'm back i thought it was megan so i was a little anyways i'll go <laughs> ashley <laughs> So SpongeBob has been a cartoon. He's been movies. He's a blimp in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Now he's on stage. Where do you guys see SpongeBob going next? Well, the the the, the SpongeBob uh, 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 twenty season chip that is implanted directly into your medulla uh, and plays nonstop <laughs> on a loop, uh, uh, like like a fun Clockwork Orange, like a <laughs> Clockwork Pineapple, is is the uh, is. <laughs> It's, it's the next step. We're working on it. Got it. <laughs> How about you, Ethan? What, where does it go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Like, we've already got the blimp. So I think the next step is a projector mounted on the moon so that it can be just above the clouds that's coming down. You can just be like, oh, I'm about to miss fun. But, oh, no, like, just watch it above us. <laughs> so, yeah, like ozone layer. Um, I love it. A little porous. Love it. Yeah, and the, uh, since the ozone layer is not there anymore, it gives us right. a clear review. Yeah. Right, so it's something that's good for the Earth. That's gone. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Speaking of which, Thank thanks for using sustainable bamboo in your uh, in your background. Oh, you're it welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Very eco friendly. <laughs> Next up is Megan Cooper. Yes, Hi, so Ethan, and I'm dying to know, is there a learning curve to get SpongeBob's laugh down? And Tom, did you offer some direction? Um, well, you know, like Ethan was saying, like, like uh, you know, the b b cartoon SpongeBob and Broadway SpongeBob were necessarily uh, uh, different from each other. And, and the way that I do the laugh, which is, nah, 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 that's sort of not an option when you got to be doing all the choreography and stuff that Ethan was doing. So, so Ethan, yeah, Ethan pretty much put his own spin on all things SpongeBob, including the laugh. Yeah, I, I feel like the first thing that I realized was I couldn't do this thing. So I had to like figure out how to like use vibrato or something. You know, it's just like a little tighter. Um, but it, learn, I can't do learning it. curve. Woof, there was a learning curve. I, when I auditioned for the when I auditioned for the part originally. I was way too intimidated to, to try and do this thing that was so, um, you know, iconic and recognizable. So I just showed up and I like did like a ha ha, you know, like some, some version of it. It was terrible. And Tina I'll was deal like, with the laugh thing later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, after that, after that, I booked the part, after I, after I booked the part, <laughs> I'll deal with the laugh. And the director was like, um, okay, great work on most of the audition. Why don't you come back and do the laugh better? It's important. Um, so I started, uh, I started then and it was like a, you know, it was just sort of years of also, I mean, just to speak to the thing that we were talking about before, it was just years of like, okay, like this sounds like the laugh, but it doesn't seem like I'm laughing, you know, like, let's figure out how to um, make it feel like natural and me and whatever and all of that sort of actory stuff. Yeah, um, but with the laugh. I know there, there's definitely science behind all this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, like people uh, oftentimes don't realize that, you know what I mean? That there's actually like all this kind of math and, and kind of figure, you know, you know, test tubes and, you know, mental test tubes, you know, figuring things out of like, how do I m make this noise or, 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 or put forth this physicality, you know, on stage or, you know, how, how do you do that? You know? And uh, I, mean, uh, I think the Broadway show did such a great job with uh, overcoming physics. I mean, Tina would even say like 10% more or like 30% less, 
It was like really was like we were trying to like dial in, you know. Like, our heads up, so, you know. Thank you. <laughs> That's twenty eight point eight percent. I said thirty. Would you please do your job? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to finish up this group with Amy. Great. Hi, Ann. Um, Okay, so as somebody who has maybe like one funny voice that I don't even do that well, I'm always blown <laughs> away by people who are great at voices, but especially somebody like you, Tom, who is so prolific and does so many well-known voices. How do you keep them all straight? You know, uh, keeping them straight is 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 easier than, than just uh, just – kind of finding new stuff for your voice to do you know i mean i i love auditioning i i i audition every day right you know right here right here in this room with this uh this microphone here uh uh you know just and i and i tell my agent like send me everything the straightest most boring stuff to the craziest you know i member fdic to the craziest cartoons you've ever heard in your life because i like doing it all and just figuring it out and and uh you know, that that's the fun part. It's really all I ever wanted to do. You know, I, I never, like being a cartoon voice guy was my dream job as a, as a kid. It's not like someplace, something I arrived at after going after, you know, well, wow, I just wound up here, which a lot of voiceover people did. They were doing other stuff and then they go, wow, voiceover is cool. Maybe I'll just stay here. I was always like clawing my, trying to claw my way into voiceover, you know, and it was uh, the, the toughest nut for me to crack, you know, like harder than, than on camera and right. And, stand up and writing like like getting my nose under that voiceover tent was like took for uh, forever seemingly you know so so that you know I'm just, I'm just glad to be doing it. so I like thinking up all those different voices that's fun and then keeping them straight is the the voiceover director's job I'll let them do that <laughs> that's it well thank you thanks <laughs>